we now move on to Swarm Creativity and Relationship Marketing, a case study of the Raptors. And our speakers, who are suitably adorned, are Alex Gillick. Gillick? Gillick? Yes. Gillick. Yeah. Who is described on your website as a teaching fellow, but as far as I can see, he's doing three research projects. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody in this department, or school, I should say, is mistreating Alex. <laughs> 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 I understand this program leader for the master's degree at the Institute for Contemporary Music Performance, and as you can see from his uh, ear, he's a drummer, and it says on his website he's a seasoned performer of rock, punk, jazz, blues, and musical theatre, and various combinations thereof. I'm really looking forward to this paper as well. <laughs> I think this paper will be a bit like the albums we produce with band, which is uh, 42 slides in 15 minutes, plus 42 songs in <laughs> we try to kind of uh, recreate the, the feel of being one of our, our live experiences. Here's some pictures of our stuff. Um, this is our, our logo, a thousand percent rock. It's sometimes more than one band. Um, that's Alex. <laughs> Dr. Gillett. Here he is again. Um, this is me recording in Ireland with a, with a drum face. And uh, that's my favourite hat. <laughs> uh, most recent gig. I nearly wore it today, but didn't. Um, as you can see. Um, here we are, the three of us. There are, there are three of us. I know, pretty intimidating stuff. Um, same hat. Um, you had leather trousers, didn't you? Give me that protector at the end. Uh, this is, we have a song called Skate Fast, Die Hard. We're kind of influenced by zombie movies, um, as the artwork indicates. Okay, and then we. There's a word for us. There are, there are, there are academics. These people exist. Um, there's, a, there's a book by Zach Furness, punk academics, um, and he's looking at punks who found themselves in the academy, people who you know, grew up in punk bands and suddenly found they have something critical to contribute, and they're now punk academics. Um, and there's, a, there's now a punk scholars network uh, in the UK. We have our first symposium that day in April. Um, here it is. I actually missed it, um, but it was, it was But it's, it's exciting stuff. It's taking off, so. And we're hoping to get involved. So, we're looking at collaboration across fields. Oh, there we are. Um, Alex is from a business marketing um, background. My, my background is sociology of music and music education. Um, and oh, that was really fast. Except for the book. So, we've had this, there's been talk about this already today, how the kind of academic silos and how this environment here is particularly good for bringing them together. So, um, something. I'm, I'm looking at at the moment a lot of my research, and we're working on it together actually in some upcoming publication, hopefully, is um, the dialogue in music education and in business seems to be interacting. All of my music students and music graduates are hoping they have to be music entrepreneurs. Because if you come out of school playing drums really well, what does that mean? You have to make a career out of this, um, it turns out. So, um, so the, kind of the, the, discourse is, is, the discourses are similar, or related anyway. It seems to be a lot more emphasis now on people who play music to be able to somehow have more input on managing their careers and be independent, really, I think, as yeah. well. There's less of a big deal seem to be out there, so. Well, I came to a conference here as the Art of Management and Organisation Conference um, back in September, and uh, it was, I've since had collaborations with three scholars um, from business schools based on the paper I did, or we did actually, we weren't here for it, about the band again, because the, the interactions, the discourse in the business world seems to be very similar. We're talking about similar things, and that we're actually coming up to that shortly. So we, this is an autoethnography, um, so sort of, it is an autoethnography. I like this quote, difference, huge gap between the experience of living a life and the narratives about it, what it's actually like to be doing stuff, hence the Centre for the Study of Working Lives, seems like a great place. Um, there's um, a recent paper, well not that recent actually, one that I read recently by Williamson, Quinlan and Frith, uh, in which they talk about the way that the discourse in music, popular music studies um, in the academy doesn't reflect what's going on in the music business really, and there's this kind of distrust mutually between real life and the academy. And then you get people who are kind of like us who are sort of in the music business and in the academy, um, which is kind of exciting. Um, one Chris Kennett writes some very disruptive papers as well, interesting guy to look out for him. Um, and here we are, in a home where we can bring it all together. So we're framing our presentation thus, um, whoops, that was too quick, okay. Coins, uh, collaborative innovation networks, Peter Glor. Um, relationship marketing, this is Dr. Gillett's specialty. 
um, and creativities. This is, um, this is something I came across fairly recently. Um, in this book, it uh, comes out of music education. It's a scholar at Cambridge, Pam Bernard. Um, she's got another book. She's got four books coming out in two years, which is extraordinary. Um, and this is her, her new book. I have a paper coming out in this book in which we're looking at um, turning music graduates into, into sort of creative entrepreneurial people again. So these crossovers are happening in, in both literatures. Um, so we're going to look at the eruptions of creativities. Um, Pam Bernard talks about various kinds of creativity. Um, we've got collective creativity, production creativity, and entrepreneurial creativity. She identifies these as creativities. Um, and today, scholarly slash academic creativity. If this is creative, who made, who made the presentation? Um, so this is the book cover for the coins, Peter Gould. Um, and yeah, this is what he says. Have a read of this. This idea about um, working collaboratively without hierarchy. This is kind of how the eruptors work, the band. Common goals, we're all trying to make music together. Um, and in fact, in the book, he talks about another, he talks about a jazz trio as well, um, that he thought was an example, an example of a collaborative innovation network. So this would be the primary currency of the reward of peer recognition. We're not in this for the money. Um, for academics and musicians, why would you be in it for the money? Um, but it's about people acknowledging what we do and we like it. If we're happy, then we can't even have follow sleeves for our jackets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if we're happy with it, if we're happy with the album, mate, it's a great album. Yeah, that's enough, isn't it? Um, okay. So this is what we do. We have. It's fairly democratic. We all play lead instruments, so you know, <laughs> I'm in charge. Of that. Um, I mean, we play the vocals. Uh, so these are. But this is what we would term, when we're when, when, when performing and recording together, this would be our collective creativity. And then our production creativity is this, making and recording albums um, from the creativity literature. Now this is similar in a way to, the, to the, what Peter Glaw talks about, talks about with his coins. He talks about three ways in which coins work. They innovate through massive collaborative creativity. They, or we, collaborate under a strict ethical code and communicate in direct contact networks. So that's number one. The massive collaborative creativity. This is, what's this? This is where we uh, recorded most of our stuff. Um, it's quite an album. So an important point about this, uh, this coin, or this swarming we'll come on to, is that we all live in different places, okay? So Jeff is the singer and lead bass player, and he lives in Ireland and has this little studio in a, a sort of converted barn in someone's small building, I guess. Okay, he set it up as a little studio. Uh, Gareth lives in London, I lived um, I live in York now, but previously a little further up the M19. So getting together, this wasn't like the usual local band where you get together every Thursday evening and play for two hours and then play the occasional gig and not do much else. We fly in from all over, get together, intense long weekends and things like that, and just crash out loads of stuff we've been working on, we collaborate then online, sending various things to each other, recordings and, and so on and so on ideas. So this is, but this is where we all come together, so where we all swarm down, and this is the, the studio. Hence the bees on the opening side, if anyone's studied it. Swarm yeah. creativity. Yeah. That's where the swarm um, term comes from. So, back to this. Um, this is how we collaborate in this way, and in this way, we are called collective uh, different production creativities, as it Creativity literature. And Richard Sennett, I don't know if anyone knows his work, he's an economist and a musician. Um, he works at London School of Economics. He's a sociologist, very smart man, intimidatingly smart. Um, he talks about dialogics, how musicians work together. This kind of discourse where you sort of agree to disagree. Um, and there's will often be in situations where you bring a riff in that the bass player will get wrong, and then, but that's fine because it's how he does it. And the tune will go completely the wrong way to what I expected, but that's all right because you did it that way. So and it, it's yeah. like you kind of that's how it works. You know, it's never, we never have an agenda we're trying to meet. It's like as long as it works. Yeah, and, and like we may discuss stuff and have disagreements, but it never comes to like you know the old spinal tap thing. You know, it never gets quite that bad. It's it, it, it works itself out. So there's a, a certain a certain friction, a certain yeah. it works quite well creatively. And he calls this the subjunctive mood, which is nice. Okay. And um, so the the strict ethical code. Um, so he calls it this. The, Delicate balance of reciprocity, the tau, um, and kind of mutual respect. This is from Pam Bernard's creativities thing. She's, she's, so she's looking at musicians working together, um, and it's having a higher sense of purpose than 
What about me using the drum to invent a guitar for now? Collaboration. This is a beautiful quote, I think. Um, it touches on something I think Karen said earlier on, the idea of generosity. It was working with a junction of generosity and self-interest. I want it, and we want it, and, you know, it's fairly self-serving because it's us that wants it, but you know, it's sort of generous up to a point. And all of our fans as well. All of our millions of fans, yes, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so this is, okay, with our communication in direct contact networks, this is, this is where the coin stuff meets the relationship marketing literature. Um, a cyber team, self-motivated people. No one asked us to form the bank, you know. Um, and this is what Alex was saying about how we work virtually um, and really. We do this. All of this stuff happens online, sometimes person to person, occasionally not. Enabled by the internet and bees. This is our first album, feel free to buy it on iTunes. No, um, t shirts available. Branding, branding. Um, so, and uh, this is our second album, Mike Greg Massacre, recently reissued. Yeah, um, Japan only released, but got a few copies under my bed still doing all some of that. Seduce and Destroy. Um, there's a, like a triple irony, I think, in the title, which we can't explain now. Um, this is a split CD we brought out. Alex, over to you. Okay, so the idea of the, of the coin, as we've crashed through it very quickly, is about like the band, so like the, the unit, the three of us, um, the internal, if you like. You know, anyone who's familiar with the idea of relationship marketing understands that that is about a broader context. And um, earlier on, we've heard about things like the, the, uh, the external relationships, for example, is, is key. And, and I'd say, and if you've got to look at anything, you've got, to, you've got to look at that framework around it as well. So when we start looking at the coin, it's like, yeah, but there's all these other influences as well. There's like a wider network, there's like a wider hive, if you like. Um, so the idea of relationship marketing, I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but it's whereas a uh, previous you know, marketing approaches that say product price plus promotion and so on. But if we look at music, it's a little bit limited because if you just define what you do by product and distribution, then you call yourself a record company. But when everything goes online and there's not so many records to sell anymore, you can be out of business. Okay? So you've got to look a bit broader than the old ideas of what marketing approaches. So I like this, okay? Look through the relate like see networks and, and, and interaction as being important. Look through this as a lens how you might explain what's going on. There's other perspectives that you could use to look at what bands and musicians do as well in this case, but this is this is my lens, if you like, the lens that I've chosen to, to use. So if we, if we refer to relationship marketing, to save you reading kind of 20 years of literature, you can boil it all down that there's a sort of a, a scope of relationship types. Uh, customers, and I've put that in these kind of, uh, you know, loosely termed customers in this case. Suppliers, internal and external, right? No, crossover and co-creation. The people in the bands, when it comes to things like punk and probably other musical genres as well, which are a bit underground, and you could say use words like tribes and subcultures and things how you define that. But often the people in the bands are often also the people who are buying music and going to the gigs. Okay? They might supply services to the bands. It might be we need a bass player for Thursday night, can you do it? Yes. It might be you've got badge making kit or a CD burning facility or just some knowledge of someone who can and, and you access it, you know, so you, there's this interaction and kind of using each other for services and stuff, okay? Um, contacts and, and your network's are really important and even before I was in bands myself, I used to buy, you know, vinyls and things, records, CDs, mail order and demo tapes and stuff. And you'd get adverts, so bands would send out their demo tape, you'd, you'd send them a couple of quid in the post, carefully sealed. They send you their download tape, and then it would be a list of other bands whose stuff they distributed. So the, the bands themselves created an underground like mail order and now online kind of distribution network. So you can buy this stuff in HMV or anything. But if you looked in the back pages of Kerrang or Metal Hammer or whatever you're reading as a 14-year-old, you could find a band advertising a demo tape, buy it, and it would give you access to all these other bands, usually with weird and semi-offensive names you've never heard of. <laughs> and you could uh, you could find this stuff. Don't tell me what used to be called. <laughs> okay, so customers, those who we supply directly or indirectly, okay? This could be promoters of live music who will give you a gig and some exchange. It could be venues, uh, record companies in a looser sense. For us, it's often one guy with a not-for-profit label releasing music because he's trying to keep the scene going or whatever, okay? We license the music to them, so we record at our expense 
and then they say, yes, you can press up so many of these for a certain period of time, and then you'll keep so many copies, we'll keep so many. You'll get it into Amazon.com and HMV and stuff, and you can keep that money, and we'll sell them at gigs, or usually send them out for reviews and stuff, and we'll take care of that, okay? So it's, it's a not-for-profit type approach, it's an underground type thing that we're talking about here. Um, consumers of music, pre-recorded lives, they might be the people who buy the CD or the MP3 or go every day and pay three quid, five quid, ten quid to get in. It could be media production TV companies and stuff, so we have had some music on, like if you tune into Channel 5 or Channel 4 on a 7 o'clock or 3 a.m. on the morning and there's some snowboarding or extreme sports going on, you might hear some bad stuff. I've got four pounds from Jerry's on. <laughs> okay, so those who supply to us might be things I've talked about earlier, okay, so we have supplied them. Internal, we've talked about that, so the three of us, the list of theories and things that we, we bring to that, okay. And then external, so the PRS has mentioned, performing rights society, royalty related, press, media, other cultural influences, magazines and so on, websites, where we get reviews, the day jobs we have, okay two academic types in the band, and so on from Gareth. So we've got other things going on. So there's these different relationships and time pressures and things. And we're using together to inform the So them. Yeah, exactly. So I've created this little model. We've got to create this little model. The coin we've talked about, that's the internal relationships that's talking about. External and supplier. And then we've got this idea of consumers and customers as another one. And so we can see we've got the coin surrounded. It's within this network and we've put in this new triangle. So, I mean, I, we, we sort of brought these three literatures together, not sort of, we did, we brought these literatures together, and the creativity for me was the thing that kind of went, ah, they, they're so sort of related um, to business and the music stuff. Um, it's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, which is very exciting. Um, very exciting, really. So, it's marketing, popular music, music education, separate, and also very interconnected domains. I like this. That's, that's important. I'm going to try and memorise that. Seven. Yeah. There's one more diagram. So this was, um, oh, we can see it, I think. Can see that. Great. So it kind of shows, again, how these things are all interconnected. You've got the coin, which is the same as the internal relationships, and the, co the collective and production creativities is also basically the same as the innovation and collaboration um, from, the, from the floor swarm creativity. Supplier, customer, and external relationships equals communication. And then, which is sort of in an entrepreneurial creativity, um, I don't know what it's in, an environment of entrepreneurial creativity, there we are, which is what um, Bernard would call it. So, this is nice. So, yeah. this is but one case, and it's one that we, we know about intimately, so we can talk about it at great length, probably for days on end if you want, you we won't. But it's also transferable because we, this is stuff we've observed in other bands as well, okay? It, I think more research. Will and in that Punkademics book I mentioned earlier on, um, which is also a similar book, and they talk about lots of cases of how this is, how the DIY scene and the punk scene and things are very similar to this, so uh, thank you for that. Yeah. We're out of time. Yeah, great. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, this is getting more and more interesting.